Our day two keynote speaker will be Jessica McKellar. Jessica is an entrepreneur, software engineer, and long-time open source developer. She is a director for the Python Software Foundation and an organizer for the Boston Python workshop dedicated to Python outreach. In yesterday's education panel, Jessica shared her insights, and I believe today's speech will be inspiring. Let's welcome Jessica. I'm causing some trouble here by having a complicated introduction to this talk. Good morning, PyCon. We start today, this morning, deep underwater, 1,000 meters below the surface of the ocean. This is the land of giant squid, benthopelagic sharks, anglerfish, and python. So this is where we start our journey today. My name is Jessica. I'm a director for the Python Software Foundation. I am an organizer for Boston Python. I spend a significant portion of my life thinking about diversity outreach in the Python community. Um, and today we're going to explore Python on this planet, Python under the sea, in space, and then bringing it all back home. So we start today deep under the ocean floor. And Python is actually executing here. Uh, Teledyne Gavia is an Icelandic company that builds autonomous underwater vehicles to map the ocean floor at depths of up to 1,000 meters. Uh, these AUVs are conducting marine research. They're mapping the ocean floor. They are doing, um, they're facilitating uh, deep sea search and rescue missions. And on these AUVs are Python code uh, managing their control systems. I think that's pretty amazing that, you know, even in these sort of you know, highly complicated embedded systems, Python still has a place deep under the ocean. We're gonna come up to the surface a little bit. <laughs> this is the second part of me complicating the organizers' lives. So we're gonna come up to the surface. <laughs> the lights are gonna come up a little bit, <laughs> slowly. <laughs> we're gonna come up to the surface, up to uh, one meter, to uh, the Observatorio Nacional in Brazil where uh, physicists have built a very interesting Python toolkit for geophysical modeling and inversion. It's called Fatiando a Terra, which is Portuguese for slicing the earth. Uh, and it's an open source toolkit that's available on GitHub. Anybody can work on it. Uh, and it's used to better understand and model the inner structure of the earth. Uh, for example, uh, to better understand how earthquakes work. And any improvements that we can make here are a big deal because this represents saving lives. So it's cool that Python is being applied in contexts like these as well. And I know that we have a ton of scientists in the audience, so hopefully these examples resonate with you. Creeping up slowly, 30 meters above the surface of the ocean, we're in Melbourne now, Melbourne, Australia, where Australia's Bureau of Meteorology is using Python for water availability forecasting. And this is a big deal in Australia, which is um, largely desert. We need to know when we're running out of water. 
Um, you know, farmers need to know this. We need to know about um, flooding predictions. So this is a really critical piece of infrastructure for Australia's government. Um, and Python is used throughout the forecasting process. Everything from ingesting the data to doing hydrological modeling and the data analysis to um, producing the uh, summaries, the PDFs, the uh, graphics um, that are provided to the public and to other government agencies for consumption. And this bureau is very hip, I have to say. They're busy using NumPy and SciPy and Matplotlib and Pandas, sort of all of the tools that we would want them to use to produce you know, open source software that helps them uh, model um, their uh, weather ecosystems. So I think that's pretty cool as well. Creeping up, creeping up. We're at 40 meters now. We're in the United Kingdom. And the UK has a very cool site called data.gov.uk, which is a deployment of the Open Knowledge Foundation's open source CCAN data publishing tool. Uh, and it, here's you know, one such uh, uh, portion of data.gov.uk, and we see that it's providing um, facilities for governments, local and national governments, to open up their data for public consumption. And this CCAN platform um, is built using the Pylons web framework. So it's a totally open system for uh, transparency and open data in governments. And the Open Knowledge Foundation's mission is really, if we build good tools, governments will use them. You know, if we make it easy for governments to open up their data, they'll do it. Uh, and uh, this CCAN platform has been used not just by the UK, but by governments, local and national, around the world. And I think this, you know, as a, I think this is really important. You know, transparency in government and Python being a part of um, improving that ecosystem, I think, is very, very cool. Rising up further, we're now in Gurgaon, India, 200 meters above the surface of the ocean, and we're at a radio station. I think it's kind of cool. Gurgaon is a major financial and industrial center in India, and it has the third highest per capita income, but it also suffers from significant um, economic and educational inequality. Um, particularly in the rural areas, it has very low rates of literacy, a lot of migrant workers, and um, you know, local government and local nonprofits are trying to figure out how to engage um, these uh, less privileged communities. And they're doing this through some really interesting tools. One of them is a, is a community radio station called Gurgaon Ki Awaz, uh, which focuses on engaging and empowering the poor people in this region. They cover topics like healthcare, career counseling, women's rights, and um, they, they do this by um, you know, pr pr uh, producing an environment where um, these people feel comfortable um, sharing their experiences. And one of the ways they do that is through building sort of entertainment that relates to these rural folks. And researchers at IIT Delhi and IIT Bombay have been partnering with this radio station to figure out ways that are actually effective to engage this community. Um, and one of the ways they've been doing, uh, they've been experimenting with this is with um, an interactive voice response system, or an IVR, uh, built using open source tools, including uh, Asterix and, and Python. And they use this IVR uh, for a number of experiments, but probably the coolest one that I saw is that um, they wanted to see if they could uh, run a Gurgaon version of American Idol, or like, you know, you've got talent, or, you know, the next big voice. Um, and they wanted to see if they could do this using sort of a radio call-in center for sort of low literacy, extremely distributed rural communities. And so what they actually did is they'd have people sort of call in, sort of dial in to this IVR system that's written uh, in Django, and they would record themselves singing. And then other people would dial in, and they would vote on the songs that were, they would listen to and then vote on the songs that they thought were best. And these are often folks who um, have very low tech literacy, um, who may be illiterate, um, but you know, the they, this system was still accessible enough that they could uh, do this you know, pretty sophisticated um, competition and voting system. Uh, even on this very uh, distributed, um, you know, rural community. And Asterix, you know, open source tools, Asterix, Python, and Django all really made this possible. And this research, you know, builds up what we know about how to engage rural communities in India. 
So I think this is a, a really cool example of Python, open source, local communities, local radio communities, and local government getting together to, feel, to figure out how to best serve its underprivileged. A little higher. 900 meters. Still in India, we're in the Karnataka states, which is over in this region here. And in Karnataka, there's a nonprofit learning partnership that works with volunteers to collect and publish pretty basic data about primary schools in their states. Here are some of the data that they uh, gather. And it, you know, if you think, when we think about India, I mean, India is a, is a huge country with a huge population and um, just millions of students in schools. Um, and so it takes a lot of coordination to even get basic data like which schools have electricity and if schools have enough bathrooms into the hands of government officials. So using Django and web.py um, and a bunch of migration tools and automation scripts all written in Python and available on GitHub, um, this nonprofit is uh, working to bring data into local government for good evidence-based education policy. I think this is just a, a really cool example of Python making people's lives better. We're getting up there. 2160 in South Africa, in Northern Cape. Here, we are building a 64-dish array telescope. Currently under construction, it's called Meerkat. Uh, and when it's finished construction in 2016, it will be the largest and most sensitive radio telescope in the Southern Hemisphere. Meerkat's control and monitoring subsystem is a very sophisticated distributed system running on Linux, integrating you know, their antennas, their receivers, um, hardware and software health checks. I mean, all of this stuff is written in Python. But we can go higher. How about this? Let's get ourselves to the South Pole, to Amundsen Scott, South Pole Station, 2840 meters above sea level. And this is really interesting. So the station is you know, quite elevated. It's on this ice shelf. And the experiments are running here from, from this you know, research station. But one of the experiments that they're running is actually deep under the ice. So the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory, located at the South Pole Station, is a neutrino telescope. What they've done, if we look at this sort of uh, diagram on the right, it's showing the heights of you know, a bunch of really tall buildings. And um, this system has, using hot water drills, has embedded neutrino detectors uh, one to two kilometers below the top of the ice shelf to detect Chernikov radiation emitted by neutrinos interacting with the ice. And this seems like a lot of work. You know, why would you set up the system in, at the South Pole you know, on this ice shelf drilling down two meters? And, and the reason is because it's actually a really good environment for detecting neutrinos. It's very, very dense and very, very dark two kilometers under uh, the ice, which is exactly what you want for detection. Ice Cube's data acquisition system is written in Python. And this is, this is really important stuff. IceCube is gathering data to help us understand dark matter, and thus the Big Bang, and thus where we came from. And it's all happening in Python. Also cool is that, you know, again, very hip scientists down there, they're all doing their work in IPython Notebook. Um, they use Python and IPython Notebook for the university classes that analyze data from IceCube in their homework assignments. In general, when I was sort of, you know, I, I asked people around the world, I wanted to cover all seven continents, and in particular, you know, science with Python is, is looking pretty good right now. There's a lot of open data, open source tools. It's on GitHub, it's under a permissive license, it's using um, Python and other free and open source languages and utilities. I think this, you know, the state of open and reproducible science I think it's looking pretty good from the perspective of our ecosystem, at least. It's very cool. Oh, but we can go higher. We can go way higher. So here we are, several kilometers above the surface of the Earth on the International Space Station. And I was worried that I wasn't going to be able to say that Python runs on the ISS. It, uh, you know, it's a lot of it is super embedded. It's really old. A lot of it is in C and C++. But 
Oh no, Python is alive and well on Robonaut. Robonaut is um, a, a really sophisticated, um, semi-autonomous, um, humanoid, humanoid robot. Um, you can see that it has very dexterous fingers. It's capable of very delicate tasks. Um, and it is on the ISS right now, uh, typically called upon to perform simple or repetitive or especially dangerous tasks in space. And Robonaut uses Python extensively uh, for its central command system. So collecting and routing data, uh, for example, if it, if it has collected and stored um, vision data from its cameras, you know, that gets dispatched to its vision analysis software um, using its brain, which is written in Python. So we started 1,000 meters below the surface of the ocean, and we got all the way up to near space. And Python is there and everywhere in between. I think that is very cool and an example of how Python is successful in incredibly diverse ecosystems around the globe. But let's take it back home for a minute. So here we are, we're about 60 meters high, and what is next for Python? I mean, have we just won at this point? We're on the International Space Station. What is next? I think that actually 2014 is a pretty good year for us to come back home a little bit and revisit our core competencies and make sure that we're doing as well as we want to do with them. Here are a couple of examples of this. So one of the great reasons to use Python is that it's a, it's a robust cross-platform language, right? How many of you use Windows primarily? couple of hands, not too many. Yeah, so this is common, you know, at conferences, not that many people, you know, I see a ton of MacBooks, not that many people raise, raise their hands when I say Windows, but you know, the reality is that the vast majority of consumers are running Windows, right? So most people on the planet are using Windows, and we know from PyPI's download statistics that millions of people, millions of people, are installing Python and Python packages for Windows every year. And it's not just users. Um, here are statistics from W3 Schools, which has been gathering operating system platform statistics since 2003. And we see that even developers who are looking stuff up online are primarily using Windows. You know, life is harder on Windows with Python. <laughs> it's harder to learn Python. It's harder to contribute to Python. And it's really hard to produce standalone executables the way that you want in Python. Here's an example. So this is um, some, some of the Python 3, like the current Python 3.4 documentation on using Python on Windows. And this is just a, a, an example of um, the need for more attention to this stuff. I don't know how long it's been since you've thought about Windows CE. It's probably been a while. Um, sort of the most up-to-date documentation that we have to help our poor new users uh, are, you know, blog posts from 10 years ago. And it's not because we don't want to care. I want to care. I mean, look, I, I'm running, um, I use a Mac, but I want people to be successful in Windows. But we collectively need to value the platform that the majority of our users and developers are using. I run a lot of introductory workshops for Python. And, you know, when you go through this process of teaching absolute beginners, you revisit a lot of the pain of getting started with a language. So, for example, if, you, you know, if it's been a while since you've learned a language, you, you might not remember that when you want to get started with Python, particularly on Windows, you've got to install it. You've got to install a text editor. You probably need to know some basic command line navigation. You need to know how to run Python code from a terminal. Installing Python libraries can be pretty tricky when you don't have a C compiler built in. And distributions like Anaconda and ActivePython exist, but we don't officially recommend them. Idle exists, but it's really not a first-class development experience. You know, rarely do people use it at work. So we really need to figure out how we can best support new users and experienced users on all of our platforms, including Windows. And I'm going to need your help with this. You know, nobody wants to fix ancient Windows bugs. It's not super glamorous to update the Windows documentation, but we collectively, if we want Python to be a successful language in the long term, we need to value this together, and we need to invest a little bit of time individually on making this piece of the puzzle a little bit stronger. So if you've never fixed a Python bug on Windows, I definitely recommend 2014 being the first year for that, even a documentation bug. 
Okay, so coming back to basics, you know, Python is a cross-platform solution. We want it to be a strong experience on all of our platforms. Speaking of platforms, there's sort of an emerging platform that we should really be paying attention to. And that is mobile. Here are some slides that are plotting data from the World Bank and GSMA and IDC and Gartner and a couple other places that spend a lot of time getting high quality data on this stuff. And if we see, and this is, um, I'm borrowing this from a blog post by Ben Evans, but if we look at this chart, we see that we recently crossed an inflection point. Uh, recently, smartphones outpaced sales for desktop machines. You know, that's the new reality that we're living in, right? Like, we are selling way more mobile devices than we are desktops. And if we look at some predictions about 2017, we see that not a ton is going to change for PCs, but mobile growth, smartphones, tablets around the world are going to see significant gains. And what does that mean for Python? Right? Can I build mobile apps in Python? And a lot of times when people talk about this, it's a sort of a depressing talk. It's like, well, okay, you know, uh, Apple chose Objective-C and Android chose Java and like, we're just not going to be able to compete with that. But actually, I would argue that this is still an opportunity for us to figure out where we want to be strong and where we feel like we don't need to be. So you can definitely write mobile apps in Python. Here is a multi-touch Android app written in Kivi. There are around a dozen iOS apps and maybe two dozen Android apps in their respective app stores built using Kivi. And this could become a much bigger ecosystem. The big problem for us is we don't even know if Python is a good language for mobile because nobody does it. And the only way that we get better at this stuff is by flexing our muscles a little bit, seeing what it feels like. Raise your hand if you've written a mobile app in Python. Anyone? Nobody. Nobody in this room. Like, how can we know if we can do a good job if we've never done it? So the next time you want to work on a weekend project, maybe build a game, you know, there are a bunch of game hackathons, mobile hackathons. Try it in Python. See how it goes. Report bugs. Figure out what's strong and what's weak about the ecosystem. And if we each do a little bit of this, it'll get better. Another really big bugaboo is the web, speaking of you know, ecosystems that seem to have a big shift in dynamics right now. You know, we hear a lot of talk about how JavaScript is going to take over the world. And you know, if you look at certain types of data, this definitely seems to be true, right? So here are some GitHub statistics on language popularity. And like Python is doing pretty well. We're in fourth place. But JavaScript is really towering above everyone else, right? So this could be worrying to us. But there are a lot of other ways to slice and dice data about language popularity. Here's another language index. Um, so the TIOBE index. Um, bases its rankings on a, sort of a complicated aggregation of search results for various things for languages. But if you look here, we see that Python is doing fine, right? Python hasn't changed. And you know what has really not changed is the old enterprise stalwarts, C and Java. Like, if we talk about the whole programming ecosystem when it was really changing, you know, we should be paying attention to this. We should be learning from this. But let's keep the big picture in mind. Here's another one. That's, so PyPL is more of a leading indicator. It's based on how often um, various programming language tutorials are searched for on search engines. So this maybe is more of an indicator of what languages people want to be learning or people have to be learning. You know, Python is still moving up in the world here. But there's a lot to pay attention to. I don't know if you've seen this demo before. In 2013, Mozilla and Epic used uh, this utility called mscripten, which is an LLVM to JavaScript compiler, to port the Unreal Engine to, uh, to JavaScript, to a, a sort of a reduced set of JavaScript called ASM.js. So this is sort of the Unreal Engine running in a browser at almost native speed. This is really cool. <laughs> This is really cool, and this is something that Python should pay attention to and should learn from. Now, we may not have as direct a route towards becoming the platform for running the Unreal Engine, but I don't think that many people were predicting that this is what the ecosystem would look like 10 years ago. 
And it's people being willing to experiment and being willing to push the language forward that makes stuff like this happen. And you know, Python on the web is actually a thing that exists. So, um, you know, it's a nascent web ecosystem, but Python.js and Brython and Sculpt are Python to JavaScript translators that you can absolutely use. Uh, there's even a PyPy.js that compiles the PyPy interpreter into JavaScript via mscripten. So like this image here, this is actually PyPy running in the browser. And it, like, it takes a while to start up, I'm not gonna lie, but you, this actually works. And Sculpt is not a joke. Sculpt is used by Coursera, which is a massive online learning initiative, to teach Python to hundreds of thousands of students worldwide every year. And this is Python in the browser. Think Python, perhaps my favorite introduction to Python text. Um, a lot of teachers work in more constrained environments. A lot of times they can't install software on their school machines. And so they sort of have to resort to doing uh, programming in the browser. And a bunch of teachers who loved Python were so motivated to get over this restriction that they used Sculpt to port Think Python to an interactive version in the web. I think that's pretty cool. You know, it's a nascent ecosystem. There's a lot to learn from what's going on in the JavaScript ecosystem, but let's pay attention. Like, let's not write it off and ignore it. Let's play with this stuff. Let's play with mscript and let's play with pypy.js. Build your next website or your, your homepage, build a little test homepage uh, in Python in the browser and see what sucks and see what doesn't. Report bugs, and again, the only way that we learn about where Python can fit into this ecosystem is if we flex our muscles a little bit, if we try it. I got one more for you, and I think it is particularly relevant here. You know, one of Python's biggest strengths is its community, right? We are an international community that is hundreds of thousands of people strong. And I think we do a pretty good job here. You know, I think that a lot of other open source communities look to some of what we've done. I think we work very hard, we invest a lot of time in being an international community and a diverse international community. But we're definitely not done. We definitely shouldn't be complacent. So here's one example. Uh, if you have a kid who doesn't speak English, how do they learn Python? Uh, so, you know, the official python.org documentation has no official translations and no official plans for supporting that. Uh, some regional user groups have tried to maintain ports to their language of the official documentation, uh, but it's, you know, it's hard and it's ad hoc. And we don't really have a story for this. What should our story be for 10 years from now? Like, what would most help Python become a more global language? Here are a couple of other facts. So the Python Software Foundation has a grants program, uh, a, a robust one at that. Um, we, we are constantly funding conferences and workshops and diversity outreach events, but almost all of the money is going towards North America and Europe. We have a sprints program dedicated to feeding you pizza while you work on your favorite open source Python projects. We have never sponsored a sprint in Asia. And I think it's because we've never gotten a request and finally, the PSF has never had a director from outside North America or Europe. So it's hard for us to have perspective. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm from San Francisco. Uh, you know, I'm one of these statistics. I think we want to do as good a job as we can, but we need the perspective of the global community to make this happen. And this is only really going to happen if the global community steps up and helps us do this. So we need your help. Another really nice example is PyLadies. There's a PyLadies here, but not in very many other places in this region, and not in South America, and not really in Africa. You know, it's great that we have an ecosystem that supports this type of diversity outreach, but it's very uneven, right? We need local communities to help us make this as robust and diverse an ecosystem as it can be. Okay, so what can we do here together? You know, there are hundreds of us in this room. What can we do today, this week, this year? You know, we're fortunate to have um, this sorting organization to help us effect great changes in our community. The Python Software Foundation is 
a 501c3 nonprofit. It has a budget. Um, it helps conferences. It helps run events. And there are a number of resources that you, you, I'm making eye contact, you can actually ask us for support to run events in your communities. And I hope that you will do that. So one option is this sprints committee. Maybe something that really excited you was this sculpt idea, this Python implementation in the browser that schools are using to teach Python. Sculpt is a free and open source project that's on GitHub that has open bugs. And you all could get together and work on it if you want. And we'll even pay pizza. We'll, you know, we'll buy pizza for you to do this through our sprints program. We have an entire committee dedicated to outreach and education. If you want to start a PyLadies group, if you want to know how to start a PyLadies group, if you want connections to other people who have done this, shoot us an email. And then for everything else, there's a grants program. We have funded $10,000 worth of development on PyPy. We funded weekend workshops for kids learning how to use Python on the Raspberry Pi. We funded porting uh, libraries to Python 3. You know, the world is really your oyster if you will ask us. And so here's my challenge to you all. The next time you come back here, a year from now, for APAC 2015, do one thing with Python that you've never done before. Maybe this is building a mobile app. Maybe this porting your homepage to Python. Maybe it's running an outreach event in a place that's never had one before. Maybe it's fixing a Windows bug in Python. But if you do one thing that you've never done before, you're helping us collectively flex those muscles and make this ecosystem a little bit stronger. And if we all do this and come back next year and share what we've done, that will represent a significant difference. There are hundreds of people here, hundreds of people. You know, if you remember, there's only like maybe a dozen iOS apps in Python in the App Store. If each one of us built an iOS app, that would, you know, would someone do the math on how, like, what number of 100% increases that is? So do one thing that you've never done before and then share it next year. Okay, that's my call to action to you. Thank you so much, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions? I have a question. Yeah. And uh, are there any solution for building iOS application except Kiwi? Uh, so the question was, is Kiwi our only option for iOS or for mobile? Uh, there are others. I think in particular, there are some other experimental platforms for Android. I think Kiwi is the one that has the most concerted effort right now. Uh, if you Google around, you'll, you'll find some alternatives, but Kivi is sort of winning the mindshare game right now. And Kivi actually just recently wrapped up a contest for developing uh, mobile or touch-based apps in Python. I think it'd be really fun to check out the, those entries to see how robust the flame, framework has gotten. I think Kivi's the main story right now. Other questions? Yeah. So for, for kids to easy to learn um, in early um, age, is uh, that, uh, I mean, basically for like a basic or other languages um, for kids, is uh, able to translate to using the, um, like a Chinese or the, the languages to write in the code. So like variables, like reserve words, able to use in the uh, replace to with the local language so that the, kids can use it. Um, so is there any plan for Python to do that? Thanks. Yeah, that's a great question. So the question was, you know, in some other programming context, particularly for kids, um, you, you can, uh, you name variables in Mandarin. You know, you, you have more flexibility about um, how you write and name things. Um, there are a couple of things. Number one, I would be really interested in a survey of what, what various popular programming languages do. I don't know if anyone's done that survey. I think it would be really interesting to see who has the most flexibility and what they've learned, maybe unanticipated issues that they've encountered from, from adding this flexibility. Um, I don't think that there's any concrete plan right now for Python, but this is the kind of thing that um, 
can and should be driven by the people who are impacted most, probably. So if, if folks had a proposal for how to make this a better experience internationally, I think we would love to hear about it, and we would love to invest money in some research on this. Um, should I be picking? Uh, okay, uh, you? <laughs> okay, just uh, um, a comment about uh, uh, using Chinese in Python 3. I think uh, there uh, may be a uh, remains the last mile because I myself use uh, many, many, a bunch of the Chinese uh, variable name or class name. Uh, uh, so uh, in my program, uh, perhaps 90% uh, I use Chinese. So uh, the last, uh, last, uh, last mile, mile is that I think the keyword. So I think there are, for, uh, for example, uh, 30 more uh, Python keywords. That is, uh, uh, in current state, it, it, I do not have the ability to, to make that kind of keyword. To, but uh, unless, uh, if we can allow that kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, English keyword, I think it is possible for us to write program in Chinese. And I think that is a very big step to, to, to worry that make our kids a non-English speaking uh, society to uh, write program. So I have uh, some experience about that. And so um, at this afternoon, I have the talk about that. So if you have uh, some uh, interest about that, you can come to my talk. OK, thank you. Cool, thank you. <laughs> Way in the back. Uh, I want to feed back to the previous two questions. Actually, there's a project called ZHPY, which allow you to write Python in Chinese, who is developed by Gasoline, who is a Taiwanese. Perfect, awesome. See, and the, we need, I think that lots of parts of the world don't realize this because we don't think about it on a daily basis. And it would be great to have more international discussions about some of these topics. I think it's very biased towards English-speaking countries and towards the West. So it would be great to have more dialogue in this space. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, about bringing people to Python, I, like uh, in Ruby, there's a Rails girls. That a uh, Rails girl is not just. The, I I used to thought that Rails girl is just some tutorial session that brings people to programming, but it is really not. It's just for people that want that don't know about programming at all to try it out programming, but it's in Ruby, like using Rails, and I don't know if the Python community has some similar like that. It's, uh, like its goal is not to bring people to programming, like teach them to program it, but just bring brings their interest out and just let people know about Python. And if more people know about Python, they might learn programming theself, themselves, and not just uh, we're bringing them in. And uh, a side note about, about the the previous question that using Chinese to program. Uh, Python, uh, identifiers in Python can only take alphanumerics, and, but uh, in Ruby, that you can use any character to be identifier, so maybe there's some that core Python can adapt. Yeah, thank you. Cool. Hi, uh, I have a question. Uh, we uh, we hold a Python sprint in Taipei last year. It is a kind of a test, and uh, we would like to know: Is there any key way, key key method to make the sprint more successful? This is a, a core Python contribution sprint. Uh, no, basically it is uh, op for some open source project holding oh, Taipei. So any open source project. Yeah. Yes, it depends on, so, so the question was, if we want to run sort of Python-focused open source sprints or hackathons, what are some strategies for making these as successful as possible? And some of this depends on the audience. Um, so one thing that we've, a couple of people have done that's been really interesting is running actually core Python contribution sprints. And a couple of things have been really important about making this successful. One is having sort of very explicit preparatory instructions that people complete ahead of the event. So this is going through the development guide, going through the sort of bug life cycle, and so they, they have an understanding of what the process looks like before they get to the event. And another really important thing is, is picking out, so the organizers picking out 
sort of bite-sized bugs, new contributor-friendly bugs on the projects to work on. Uh, because it's hard for new contributors to have a sense of what is a good bug or a good feature to work on versus not. So having a curated list of bite-sized bugs ready ahead of time that you can sort of assign to people based on their backgrounds at the sprints. And those two things have been really important for the success of the couple of C Python sprints that I participated in. And I think a lot of that translates to a more general open source sprint. So if you have new people, they tend to actually kind of want to be told what to do. You know, what project should I work on and what bugs should I work on in that project? And having a good answer to that is really important. <laughs> hey. Yeah, you. Uh, so when you talked about mobile, you talked about iOS and Android. And uh, the Mozilla Foundation is sort of trying to make a push, especially in emerging markets, uh, with Firefox OS and as an alternative to, to the other two highly dominant platforms. Do you know if there's a story there? Because there are teams at Mozilla that are heavily invested in Python in other ways. And I, I'm curious if there's kind of an opening there for, for Python and mobile. I, I'm not aware that there's a story. It would be good if we had one. I, I, I have a bunch of thoughts in this space. So like what one thing, and Fernando and I have ta talked about this a lot. Um, you know, I think there's an opening for the Python Software Foundation to be funding more experiments, funding more research, and funding more paid development to ensure that we're competitive in these new ecosystems. And then we also need to be better about attracting and retaining volunteers uh, to these ecosystems. And that's its own big spiel that we, <laughs> we kibitz on a lot. But um, I think that the, where we are now is we need people from the community to come to us with great ideas that we can fund and support. And that's sort of as robust as the ecosystem is right now. I, we should be doing more proactive outreach but that's where we are with our sort of bandwidth right now. I, um, I think it's pretty inspiring to, you know, you mentioned that we have to do one more thing, that, one, one thing in Python and maybe next year. But I'm curious about, do we have any kind of suggestion that we might uh, get a, the first approach to, like, if I want to contribute to uh, open source in Python, do it. Is there any kind of thing that I first should get to know before I get involved to the open source project Python? This is specifically C Python, or or any open source Python project. Uh, I'm not sure about it, but uh, is there any kind of suggestion before I uh, I have to know before I contribute to open source? So the question is sort of. What should I do before being ready to contribute to open source software, particularly open source Python projects? The short answer is nothing. Dive right in, and honestly, people are really excited to have you want to work on projects with them. Like any work that you do is work that I don't have to do. Um, there's a really cool site called openhatch.org that is a, a, it's a website and a non nonprofit um, dedicated to lowering the barriers to entry to open source contribution. And they do this in a couple of ways. They run some in-person sprints for college students, teaching them sort of in-person the tools of open source development. They have online training missions for common tools, like version control systems, like diff and patch. Uh, and they also have a project Rolodex that helps match you with projects and even with specific bugs based on your background and interests. So that might be an interesting resource, uh, openhatch.org, for folks interested in getting started with open source contribution for the first time. Hi, Jessica. Just curious, uh, do you know any like Python for teachers? Maybe Py teachers, because we heard this turn in uh, yesterday's education panel, BOF. So I'd like to uh, ask you about this question. This, this is sort of communities for teachers who, who want to yeah. use Python? Yeah. Yeah, so there's an education special interest group. So there's a, there's a sort of a Python and education mailing list that you can find on python.org. That's probably the, the most established place to do this. Anyone else? Okay. So, okay. All right, thank you so much. Okay. Have a great rest of the conference. <laughs>